I was going to call this video Python Feeding Frenzy just to get clicks. It wouldn't have totally been clickbait because I am talking about some feeding topics that I haven't discussed before, but should I call it Python Feeding Frenzy? I think I will. You guys, the video is called Python Feeding Welcome to the green room. I'm Bob Bledsoe. This is Echo, a snake that I didn't feed last night, so she can be out with me. Hi, babes. Uh, today, we're going to talk about when to and how to assist feed. We're going to talk about live feeding, which is not something I like to do, but I have to sometimes. And we're going to talk about Reptilinks, my review of them. Hey, I'll give you my review of them. They're terrible. Say hello to my brother Kent, our cameraman, who recently found out that Reptilinks are not breakfast sausages. Zero out of five stars. We'll get to reptilinks in a minute, but first I want to talk about two hatchlings that I have that still haven't taken their first meal yet. Um, I've tried frozen thawed mice, frozen thawed rats. I've tried changing their substrate. I've tried live mice, live rats, uh, and they still have not taken a meal on their own yet. So I have had to assist feed them. Um, so let's first talk about that live mouse, live rat situation. A hatchling ball python can take a hopper mouse usually or a rat pup. If you have to switch to live, like try to get them to eat uh, a live meal, the difference here is big because a rat pup still has their eyes closed and they haven't, I don't think they've developed teeth yet, but the fact is that they don't bite either way, whether they've developed their teeth or not. Um, a hopper mouse is usually a little bit smaller than a rat pup, but they definitely have developed teeth and they can bite uh, and cause a problem. So you can leave a rat pup in with your hatchling for a little while and not have to worry about it. And I want to say that a little bit carefully because you want to make sure it's a rat pup that doesn't have their teeth yet, that, that aren't bite. You, you know, you don't want it to be, you don't want to go to the pet store and they sell you a rat pup and it's not. So know what you're looking at, know, know what you've got. But typically you can, you can leave that in with, with your uh, snake and not worry about the snake being harmed. A hopper mouse is a different story. And here's an example. A follower of the channel sent me an Instagram message two days ago asking what they should do uh, because they have a hatchling snake. I think it's a hatchling, probably a couple months old or something, that they had put a, a mouse in and forgotten about it and, and went to work and the mouse chewed on the snake. And we've seen these pictures, you know, you can... You can look up pictures if you want to of, of what mice and rats can do to animals. So I'm not going to show it here. He actually gave me permission. He said, look, if you want to do a video on this, you can uh, use my photos. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you the details because it's not comfortable to look at. But the fact is that the mouse chewed on the, on the snake probably in three or four different spots and exposed the spine. And that's the situation where the snake can easily get an infection and die from that. You've got to take it to a vet and, and get antibiotic shots and hope that the snake can, can survive. There's probably some other things that you can do, betadine and, and stuff like that. But this is something that happens pretty commonly. And it's not because the keeper doesn't know any better. It's because they just forgot. You know, it's easy to drop a a prey item in there, a live prey item, and f and forget about it. So, and which is what happened in this case, and that's usually what happens every time you you see photos and you hear people go, "Oh man, I can't believe it! I feel sick. I, I just forgot." And the rat or the mouse chewed on the snake. Uh, and some of you, especially if you haven't heard of this happening before, you're wondering, "How could that happen? Why doesn't the snake just dis defend themselves?" I don't know. I don't. Uh, I don't know that they can necessarily feel it, you know, as the, as the rat's sitting there chewing. The rat's not attacking them. The, the rat's not like, oh, I'm going to get the snake and kill it. The rat's just being a rat, or the mouse, is being a mouse and chewing on the snake. And I don't know that they can necessarily feel it because the snakes tend to not really defend themselves when, when this happens. You know, there are a number of things that, that we do with our snakes that, that could potentially be dangerous. And... Uh, one of those things is is live feeding. Another one with with Echo here is when I put when I put Echo on her ladder. This is a 200 gram snake. She's she's over three feet long, but she's 200 grams, and that's a pretty tiny snake. So if she came off this ladder 
and went somewhere else, there's a good chance that she'd be gone forever. So when she's on this ladder, I have to be really vigilant and know where she is. I'm constantly checking on her to make sure that she's still on the ladder. So that kind of thing, but also the live feeding. If I have to feed live and I'm feeding a, a, anything but a rat pup, basically, I'm gonna stand there. And I might stand there for a half an hour waiting for that snake to hopefully eat, but I'm gonna stand and watch. And I'm not gonna get involved in doing something else where it might slip my mind that there's a live prey item in with my snake. I prefer to feed all my snakes frozen thawed, but in a case where we've got two hatchlings that haven't taken a meal yet on their own and I've been assist feeding them, I'm gonna offer them a live mouse uh, because they're they're most likely to take that and that's what they're going to be offered until they start eating on their own and then we'll move to to uh, a little bit larger prey because I'm offering them little tiny uh, fuzzy mice not even hopper mice but fuzzy mice which normally for a for a hatchling ball python that is too small of a meal but when you're just trying to get them to eat that's a very easy thing for them to for them to to eat is a fuzzy mouse so uh, the reason, the whole reason that I that I thought about doing this video is that a couple of live streams ago, this was several weeks ago, I did a live stream where somebody asked me how to how I assist feed, and I just talked about what I do to assist feed, and I just answered the question and and moved on. But then I got messages from a couple of people saying, "Hey, thanks so much for your advice on assist feeding. I bought a ball python a month ago and it hadn't eaten yet, so I assist fed it." And um, it made me feel terrible because I neglected to say that you do not assist feed a snake that already knows how to eat. Um, assist feeding is for hatchlings that have crawled out of the egg and have not yet ever in their life taken a meal. So the reason that you don't want to is it's a stressful thing for them to go through. The assist feed is really stressful for them. And, for, and really what you're doing with an assist feed is you are teaching them how to eat. You're just teaching them how that mechanism works. You're basically acquiring the prey for them. You're putting it in their mouth and then you're letting them swallow it on their own. But just the act of putting it in their mouth is pretty stressful for them. And it could turn off a snake to eating altogether and make things worse. If you've got a snake that's just not eating because their parameters aren't correct, you know, they don't feel secure enough yet in their new enclosure or their heat humidity is off a little bit. So they're just avoiding food for now. You start assist feeding them, that could make it way worse. So again, assist feeding is for somebody who has hatched out a snake in their home out of the egg and it just has never in its life taken a meal before. Echo's sitting on a Mag Naturals ledge above this little cot looking down on me. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, do me a favor really quick and just scroll down one, one little click and hit the like button and the subscribe button. That really helps out this channel so that I can continue making videos each week. And speaking of which, uh, really uh, thankful shout out to my Patreon supporters who have been fantastic in jumping aboard this little Patreon page that I recently started. Um, we are doing some fun things over at greenroom, no, patreon.com slash greenroompythons. And if you're interested in being a part of this uh, handwritten mid-video credit scroll, that is tier two on that Patreon page. This little asphalt girl is one of the two who has not taken a meal on her own yet. Um, I'm showing her just because I don't want to pull either one out of their enclosures and handle them because I'm going to try to get them to take a meal on their own tonight. And she happened to be sitting in her upturned hide like this, which she often does. Uh, so you can see her at least. But I'm going to, I'm going to try to feed them a, a live fuzzy mouse. And if they don't take it, which I, I don't think they're going to just because I've done this you know, the last couple of times I've tried to feed them live. Uh, and if they don't, then I will try to assist feed them. Assist feeding isn't complicated in theory. You're basically taking a little mouse, a, a thawed mouse, and getting it wet and prying the snake's mouth open with the nose of the, of the mouse and putting the, putting the mouse as far, you know, you're not shoving it all the way down their throat, but you want to put it, at least start it into their throat. I like to get at least the front shoulders past the opening of the mouth. And then you just set the snake down and the snake now has a choice to make. They're either going to spit it out. Oh, by the way, you, you also sort of close their mouth on the, on the mouse so that the 
teeth will hook. You just want to make it a little bit harder for them to spit it out, have, have them push it the wrong way. Um, and so they'll sit there and think about it and they'll either spit it out or they'll decide that it's easier if they have it go down the other direction. And again, this is just teaching them what eating is and some snakes need that. So I really hope this works tonight. We'll cut to future Bob letting us know how it went. Hey everybody, future Bob here. So here's how this went down the other night. This is Dolly one of my two holdbacks, and she's the other one that I've been assist feeding. Dolly decided to take a meal, though, the other night on her own. So she got her first meal, uh, but you know, by herself that she actually struck and wrapped. So I think she's good to go now. She's She's got it figured out. And the other one, I think we'll take a meal next week and we'll talk about why. Let me put her back and then we'll take a look at this footage. When I put the live fuzzy mouse in for number four she seemed interested uh, for quite a while but just never struck and she hasn't been interested in the past so i think she's getting there and then there's another reason here let's take a look at this assist feed because i did end up assisting her this was her fourth assist feed um that she's that she's done so it took me a long time to get her mouth open so i cut all that to to close to the end i don't know why she, she wouldn't open her mouth but um watch what happens once she does so I'm trying to pry her mouth open here and finally get it. And I I put this a little bit into her mouth, but right when I got it in, she closed her mouth on her own and constricted my hand. So now I'm gonna, we're gonna speed this up. Uh, probably, I think I sped it up five or six times the, the regular speed, but she, she's never done that before. Usually you close their mouth and then they try to open it and spit it out or whatever. But she knew to close her mouth right away before I even got the shoulders in. I was prepared to use my forceps to sort of push the shoulders in and um, didn't need to do that, obviously. Uh, and the fact that she constricted my hand, she naturally knew to constrict, which is not a thing that she's done before. It's usually, you know, normally when you you assist feed, you've got them sort of thrashing and trying to get, they'll, they'll you know, if somebody else isn't holding the snake, they'll bring their body over and try to move your hand away or move the, the mouse away from their, from their mouth. So she's doing really good here. And, uh, she, you know, obviously she ate it and she stayed constricting on my hand the whole time. So I just held her and tried to hold my hand still. I had my arm in an awkward position and my shoulder hurt, but uh, <laughs> it worked. So then I just, uh, you know, put her down and then in her tub and then put her tub back. It worked out really well. Before we go on to Reptilinks, let's cut to Kent's Corner. Hi, and welcome to Kent's Corner. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the importance of reading labels before eating your breakfast especially if you're at your brother's house. These reptilinks contain guinea fowl. Yeah, fowl is the right word. Chicken, quail, includes whole bird and some feathers. Ugh. Rabbit, bullfrog, mixed with one dozen quail eggs. 100% natural collagen casing. Super gross. Anyway, if your breakfast sausage doesn't say Hormel or Oscar Mayer or something like that, you're probably about to eat bullfrog. Thank you for watching Kent's Corner, where you always get the best warnings. Thanks, Kent. That's a really good breakfast-themed health tip. He's right about the contents of the Reptilinks. These are uh, whole prey items. They're little sausages. And they're whole prey, so that means bone, feathers, organs, all that stuff that your snake needs to get the proper nutrients. The only thing in that list that's not whole prey is the bullfrogs. Those are just frog legs, but everything else is the guts and feathers and fur all ground up. Pretty gross, but really good for your snake. Quick caveat, you guys. Don't expect a ball python to take a reptilink. I think it even says it on their website that, that reptilinks are not recommended for ball pythons. And it's just because they tend to be so picky that your chances of getting them to take a sausage are really low. You could spend a lot of money on a bag of reptilinks and it'd just be wasted because they, they won't ever take them. But for this video, I'm going to try to feed a reptilink to my most food aggressive ball python and see if she takes it. I've never tried it before, so we'll see how that goes. We'll cut to that later. That bag of reptilinks is for Echo, my little super dwarf reticulated python who I just pulled off the ledge. 
she, so it was still kind of a gamble because I only have one reticulated python and there's no guarantee that they're going to take a sausage either. You don't generally come across sausages in the wild and these snakes are used to eating wild prey. So, uh, you know, I tried a couple, I wasted a couple reptilinks trying to get her to, to take them. And I had this whole list of techniques that I was going to go through to get her to take them. And then I realized, you know, the best thing to do is just consult with somebody who has experience. So I talked to Richard Bilbo. You may know Richard from uh, Clint's Reptiles videos and from Reach Out Reptiles videos. Uh, Richard is a really great keeper of lots of different reptiles, but especially reticulated pythons. And all of his dwarfs and super dwarfs are on reptilinks. So I asked him what to do. And he, he just said, you know, give her a little frozen thawed hopper mouse to get her really in feed mode looking for another and then offer her the, the reptilink, which is what I did. And it worked perfectly. And now she takes them every time. Those reptilinks are still a little bit big for her. So I pull some of the meat out. But she only gets about one a month. Her her average monthly intake is she'll get a, a rat pup one week and then another rat pup the next week. And then she'll get a reptilink and a week off of eating at, at the end of the month or whenever it happens to be. But if she takes a reptilink, she doesn't need to eat for, for two weeks. And that's the, that's the cool thing. Reptilinks are more expensive than rodents but they're not double what a rodent is, I don't think. I mean, I guess it depends. And you don't, you, you don't have to feed as often because they're so nutritionally dense. If you can get your snake or lizard to take a reptilink, I think it's a fantastic way to mix other prey items into their diet without having to buy a bunch of random animal carcasses. Delilah is my pastel freeway ball python and she is very food motivated. She oftentimes strikes at the front of the tub when she smells a rat. And she's also target trained, more on target training in another video, but she'll sometimes strike at the target because she gets so excited uh, to eat. So I'm gonna try to feed her a reptilink tonight and we'll see what happens. Let's look at that. Hey you guys, I'm back. So let's take a look at this footage of Delilah. What I did here is uh, the, the room had been scented with rat already, so she was ready to go. And I used her target, not, not that I was trying to get her to move anywhere, but I wanted to show her her target so that she understood that she was getting fed. Um, because a lot of times when she sees that, she'll just strike at anything. And that's kind of what I wanted to happen. So as you'll see, there's the target, there's the reptilink. She does strike at it, but it was almost a defensive strike. She didn't coil and wrap. She's never done a defensive strike before. So here's the second try. I pulled it back and, and reheated it. And I didn't think that she would strike and wrap, but she does. I'm. This is now way sped up. Uh, this took a long time, but I thought she was trying to wedge it out of her mouth and drop it. You know, she. I'm sure she realizes at this point that it's not her normal prey item. But what I realized she was doing is using her body to straighten it, like she's doing right now, and um, and get it down. So this is a pretty big one. When it gets into her neck, you'll see it's a it's a pretty thick, you know, it's not very long, but it's a pretty thick uh, link. And so that's obviously why I'm taking some of the meat out when I feed Echo. She doesn't she doesn't need something that th I mean, look at that. <laughs> uh, that's fine for for Delilah. That's actually smaller than a normal uh, prey item. But she had a she ate a rat five days ago and I don't usually feed, you know, I I don't usually do every five days. I did this just to see if she would take it and she did. So we'll wait two weeks to feed her again, but she did great. All right, you guys, we did it. Thanks again for hitting the like and subscribe buttons and we'll see you next week. Just any breakfast sausage is, ugh. I can't even eat at Denny's anymore.